Yeah, welcome to the pandemic version of Montpelier <laughs> Civic Forum, where we're going to talk about the um, election that's coming up on town meeting day. That will be mainly absentee ballots, as we did in the last election. Uh, but basically, it's not in any way, shape, or form less important than any town meeting day is. In fact, because it's a town meeting day and a pandemic being held this way, it's more important. It's more important that you engage. It's more important that you vote. And we've got a great series of shows. As always, we'll do city budget with Bill. We'll do school budget with Jim Murphy, the president of the board. We will have our annual mayor's address of city all the way from the wayside to the baseball field and all the way from the sewage plant to the new thing that's going up on 302 that you'll find out about at that corner of 2 and 302. And basically, that's a great show. And we have the city council candidates as well as the school board candidates. So we've got, we even have a park board candidate for a five-year term. So this is going to be a great series of shows, well worth watching them all. They're all on Orca Media, uh, the YouTube site, as well as the cable channel site. And tonight, we have Dan Richardson, a city council, a sitting city council person running in District 3. Yes, thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. Dan, what is District 3? Can you give us the parameters of District 3? Sure. District 3 is made up of the uh, area really south of the Winooski River uh, in this, within the city confines. So it's the neighborhoods along Berlin Street, Northfield Street. Um, it involves the, the wayside, as you mentioned, is in District 3, um, Sherwood Drive. It also includes um, uh, a section of the downtown uh, Main Street, like where the Savoy is, uh, and all the way over to Hubbard Street up to Main Street, so almost to the middle school, um, District 3 extends into that downtown area. So it's an interesting district in that, um, you know, it is divided by the river. It's the only district that does have that, that sort of geographic division within it. Um, but it's also a district, I think, that's full of a lot of um, for Montpelier residents that, um, you know, may not be um, you know, the, the people that are always on the front page of the Times Argus, but are, make up the really backbone of our community. It's been called the Forgotten District. I've heard that mentioned before. You know, it's one of those things because the south side of the river, um, you know, it, it, we, I think we've talked about this before, you know, it goes back in some way to the historic origins of, of Montpelier, that a lot of that was Berlin. Uh, and the city of Montpelier seized it. Um, seized it? When? <laughs> seized it in the mid-19th century. Um, and it's actually very funny. My partner, Paul Gillis, um, you know, detailed some of this. But basically, the city of Montpelier grabbed it. And Berlin didn't vote to release it, but the legislature approved it. Um, and so we basically took the south side uh, of the Winooski River. Um, now, rumor had it that Berlin wasn't necessarily wanting to hold on to that much land. They were looking to... Uh, develop elsewhere, um, but little did they know they would have a ball. <laughs> I was going to say they lost the best part of themselves, and we got we got it, and it makes up a, a section of Montpelier. But I think the geography of the river has always been, at least mentally, for a lot of people, you, you know, a dividing line because we think of downtown Montpelier on that north side of the Winooski, um, and actually that's one of the things that I, I thought about that incurred want motivated me to run in the uh, last year for city council. And one of the projects that I feel is ongoing and was sort of put aside because of the pandemic is that, you know, we really need to invest in that south side uh, of the city. And that includes parks and that includes certain business opportunities. Um, and I think that really involves building other sort of downtown type areas um, around the District 3, where a lot of people really don't have the opportunity to walk into downtown, like say someone who lives in District 2 that might go come down College Street to State Street and, and go to the farmer's market on foot. They don't have to cross major highways. They don't have to cross, um, you know, busier trafficked roads. Yeah. Now you want a small victory, and most people won't even notice it, but the uh, wayfaring sign yes. points to the business district on River Street. It does which I think is a small victory for, 
for it District is. 3. It is. It is, a small, it is a small victory. But, you know, I see, if I think about the greatest potential in a lot of ways for Montpelier, it's that, it's that business district. It's, you know, starting to take uh, control around, like, the Pioneer Street Bridge area um, and making that more walkable, making that more usable. As you mentioned, the new construction that Tom Malone is putting up across from the uh, Formula Ford. You know, All right, don't keep us in, in, on pins and needles. What is that thing? Well, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know I, I know it's a, a commercial building that he's, he's erected, um, and I, you know, but we've seen a lot of activity in that, that area. Fred Connor and the Connor brothers have put up uh, businesses um, along the, that right-of-way uh, on 302, the old armory area. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of commercial development there, uh, and what we're not seeing, and I think what the role the city can play, is really start to tie that in to some sort of infrastructure so that we have uh, an extension of our walkable downtown to this area as well. Uh, and I think that's how cities develop, is that they often have uh, these growth areas that then get incorporated into the mixed residential and commercial uses. Well, let's get another couple of victories off that. Uh, the distillery? Yes. Uh, the walking path? Yes. Those are, I mean, those are big changes, and and that's that's in part, I think, why that Pioneer Street area is is becoming as viable as it is because of the walking path. You know, now recreation opportunities and traffic, foot traffic, extends down to, um, you know, Gallison Hill Road. We, my daughter. So the and I, auditorium uh, or the um, the Civic Center down there. Yes. That might. Uh, I, that's near the bicycle path, isn't it? It it, it is, and I think. You know, you actually can end up right there at the at, at the ice ice rink. Um, you know, you look at other cities that have well developed walking bike paths, like Burlington. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of real community um, structures and and um, infrastructure that can be put in along those paths because you get that foot traffic there. So you know, imagine for example, we already see. You know, where the bike path ends, ends at Gallison Hill, there's a, the, the old Shell station has been completely remodeled and there's a convenience store there. But if you had other small businesses there or along that way, like at the Pioneer Street Bridge, you know, there's lots of opportunities. Imagine a bike rental place um, there. So somebody could take uh, and rent a bike and, and go up and down the bike path. Um, you know, that's what we see in Burlington. That's what we see in other cities. Uh, and the more we can support that as a city, I think it really helps take this I infrastructure investment that we've made and, and boost it up. And anybody who lives in that area in District 3 now has that benefit of that, you know, really wonderful community asset. Taking us back one year when we had this discussion earlier, uh, and the other seat was up in District 3. There were two seats in District 3. Yes. We were talking about a park up there. Yes. Uh, and what is there any progress in discussion well, on that? And could you explain what sure. that's about? You would know better than I. Sure. So we've actually had a lot of conversations. Uh, Jay uh, uh, Erickson, who's the other city councilor, and I have met with Alec Ellsworth, who's the head of the park department. Um, and we've tried to identify spots along in District 3 where recreation opportunities can be had. Um, the way I've always tried to describe it to people is if you think of Hubbard Park as our central park for our city, the parks along District 3, I think, can become our emerald necklace. Uh, well, wasn't there one rather sizable piece? Th there is one in the S S Stonewall Meadows area. Now, where is the Stonewall Meadows area? Uh, sure. It's it's south of, uh, it's, it's, no, it's north of Berlin Street, um, and it's south of 302, uh, and it's off behind... Sherwood Drive and, and that neighborhood. It's, it's really the, the remnant of some of that development that occurred, I think, in the 90s. Um, but it's, it's sort of forested land right now uh, that the city does have an interest. There's also an opportunity. I think the city owns it. I believe so. Um, I'm just not certain of their in interest from a, from a legal perspective. Um, you know, there's also the other opportunity, which is the area that was formerly owned by Food Works. Where would um, that, be? that would be the oh, two down, rivers, the confluence, right. which is just across 302. R River Street, right. right. And, and, you know, there's, that's subject to a fairly thorny uh, and convoluted series of legal issues. But, you know, there is going to be probably an opportunity for the city to take some ownership of 
you know, up to 15 acres in that area. So, you know, there's, there are these parks that once you start to identify them, and if we can link them together, we, we may not have a hundred acres uh, to, to dedicate on the south side. But you've but got we, picnicking areas. You have picnicking areas. If you can link them together, you have uh, what you have in Boston, which is a series of parks that are connected. So someone can go along the south side of the river through these parks uh, for various recreational activities. And I think what we really have to, and what we were starting to have conversations with, with um, Alec was, you know, what do these recreation opportunities look like? Are they picnicking? Um, you know, one thing that I think is needed on the south side is, uh, you know, playgrounds. We, we don't have, uh, and there are a lot well, of Well, we don't residents. have schools. <laughs> Call it what it is. Sure. In District 2, you have Union Elementary School. You have Main Street Middle School. Correct. Right. Um, you know, we even have, you know, in Hubbard Park, you have open fields and, and, and such. And so, you know, I think what we're looking at is to create those type of recreational opportunities for District 3. Um, and it's going to take some work. And it was, you know, we were starting to get off the ground. And then, and then a pandemic hit. Uh, there was a pandemic that got in the way. So, you know, that's one of those pieces of unfinished, uh, unfinished business that I really hope we as a city can start to take up as we move beyond the pandemic. It's just that the pandemic has proven to be a bit more uh, resilient to moving on than we would have hoped. Have we slowed down the hill? Uh, we were, that was coming in a year ago, the speed limits going up the hill towards the hospital. It, has it, that slowed down on Berlin? It, it has. Uh, you know, obviously, a lot of the residents that pushed for that wanted it to 25, wanted it much slower. Um, but certainly, I've noticed, and I travel along that road fairly frequently, um, it has slowed down. Um, as a result of those speed limits. It doesn't travel quite as fast. The problem is always going to be sort of twofold with that road. One is it's designed as a faster road. So it's, as you're driving along, your experience is you want to go faster. And if you're not paying attention, your body, you know, your experience as a driver may lead you to go faster. And the other problem is, is that, you know, we have a, a dilemma of how we commute to Berlin and some of the commercial centers there. How so? Well, if you're in Montpelier and you want to go to the gym, the mall, the hospital, um, you really only have, you have three options. You can get on the highway, you can go up Berlin Street to And it becomes thornier to get to the hospital. Exactly. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Or you can go 302 on the backside. Right. Um, you know, we've had some, I think part of what slowed down the traffic this year has frankly been that breakdown of the culvert at the top of the hill there right before you turn off to head to the mall or to the hospital, um, which has caused people, I think, to know that they're going to have to take a circuitous route. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, we need a good way for people in Montpelier to commute or people from Berlin to commute between these two downtown areas that are developing. Um, and I think Berlin Street a long time ago was imagined as that street. Um, and 302, as a result, has gotten a lot more commercial development. When I was on the development review board, it was certainly something we took seriously and, and questioned at times, you know, whether we wanted more commercial development along 302, because that is a state highway, and it's actually a federal highway, and whether we wanted more traffic delays that would result from commercial development, or whether we wanted to make sure that road stayed somewhat clear so but aren't we a minor commuted. player in commercial development on 302? I mean, Berlin is the major player. It is the major. Barry's a minor player. Sure, but we get the tail end of it. But think about how you travel from, you know, if you say you take a uh, start at the bridge by Sarducci's and you want to get to the mall or the hospital, you know, you're going to have to go one of those two routes. You're either going to have to go up Berlin Street or you're going to have to go around uh, the 302. And if 302 becomes so packed commercially, because that commercial development extends from Berlin that already exists, that I agree completely. But you know, beyond the light, coming closer past the wayside where we have the, the tractor supply company right. or Cody Chevrolet, you know, the more that becomes commercially developed, then obviously the, the, the quicker the slow traffic starts when you get on to 302, unless it becomes, more, unless it becomes a parkway um, or a commuting road. Um, and so I think we always will have that problem. Well, when you talk about inadvertent consequence, how do the people in Sherwood feel about being a cut through? Has there been a discussion of speed bumps? 
There has been, you know, speed bumps come with certain uh, requirements and, uh, you know, certainly on certain level, certain levels of service roads, you can't have speed bumps. Um, just it, it's, it goes against the sort of standard uh, transportation, the transportation standards. Um, but, you know, I think there, that is in part what we're seeing is the, is the pressure. How, how do we deal with this? If you have people that want to go from one point to the other, and there's only so many ways to get there, you know, you can create these speed bumps, you can lower the speed limit, but it's not going to stop the traffic. But it certainly might make it more habitable on that street, if oh, sure. you, particularly if you have children. Sure. And I, I think that's something we have to continually look at and understand, you know, and that's part of, I think, a function of planning is, you know, if we can create a parkway. So that's where my point about 302 comes in, which is the more we can keep 302 as a clear option for traffic to flow through, the more people are just going to go 302 and they're not going to use that cut through. They're just going to go straight around. Um, and, you know, I think that's something we have to give serious consideration because, you know, if we don't have a good route to that area in Berlin, and, and I'll add the commercial district in Berlin, then we're going to have people cutting through these neighborhoods. Um, you know, another option that we may do is, is to stop making it a cut through, create a, a, a you know, end it as a, as a, as a throughway. I think those are options you can put onto the table, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a process that, you know, is going to require some work and discussion and Certainly, Public Works has been, you know, considerate of, of those issues. The neighbors still talk about it, I imagine. Yeah, I haven't had many, you know, obviously the pandemic has shifted everyone's focus away from the normal set of problems. So I haven't heard much from my constituents on, on Sherwood as to uh, issues, um, you know, and, but, you know, it, is, it remains a problem for that neighborhood of what does its neighborhood identity look like? And, and it goes back to my sort of first point, which is I think the more we can create sort of downtown areas that it can, you know, that would encourage walking, clear walking patterns, then we can plan around those walking patterns so that we can make sure traffic doesn't come right through the middle of that. Uh, there's an old saying that Bruce Springsteen had, and he said, when this band was playing for $500 a night, we had $500 problems. Now we're playing for $500,000 pro a night. We have $500,000 problems. Sure. Uh, in my section of, of District 2, we live in a house that's about 150 years old, and we've got 150-year-old house problems. What's the average house on the other side of the river? When was that built? So a lot of the housing, on, the, on particularly in the Berlin Street neighborhood and uh, Northfield Street neighborhood, those are, well, there's, there's a mixture, as there are some older houses, the 150-year-old houses, uh, but there's a lot of pre and post World War II housing, um, and you can you can see it. It's, it's are those starting to have pre and post World War II housing problems? Sure, I mean it's that aging housing stock starts to have issues that are specific to that uh, era of home. So, for example, um, you know uh, electrical wiring. Um, you know, if you have a 150 year old home, you probably have knob and tube, or at least had knob and tube until somebody what... updated it. Exactly. Um, and in some ways, knob and tube is great. Uh, you know, I have known an old home that has some knob and tube still in it because the electrician has said it's okay. You know, it's a limited circuit and the knob and tube is in great condition. So I can either break through this wall uh, because it's a private residence. Um, you're okay to keep your chandelier on this old system. Um, but uh, a lot of the aluminum flex tube that was used in the 50s has corroded much faster. And so, you know, they start to have issues or they have uh, lead pipes. So a town with a lot of focus on historic preservation is facing a district that that's concerns aren't historic preservation, but are different in, in terms of housing and, and how housing needs to be rehabbed. Well, you know, I think we're facing a larger issue about habitability in Vermont and not just in District 3, but, you know, there's a real question in the post-COVID world of what does ventilation and circulation look like in the older buildings and what does, you know, uh, what does habitability start to look like as we inhabit these buildings on a far heavier use than we have previously. Um, so some of these issues start to come to the forefront and, you know, it is, it's, we're going to need um, money and resources to deal with this because, you know, if you own a house, the idea of replacing your plumbing 
is a daunting. daunting. I, I remember when I was a kid, my father replaced a lot of the plumbing in our house, and he just happened to be able to, to sweat pipe. So, you know, watching him do that, but thinking about the cost that went into that, not just in materials, but then if time and labor had been charged, it would have been outside. And part of the reason he did it is because we couldn't afford it otherwise. Um, so he taught himself how to, to plumb a, a house. Um, you know, those kind of issues are going to continue to crop up for people. Um, and we're just going to see that on private residences. I think what's, what's bigger is we're going to see it in public buildings as well. Did the uh, zoning overlay it affect District 3? And, and, or, or does that need to be revisited by the Planning Commission to benefit District 3? Are there a separate set of issues? I know they spent a lot of time talking about zoning overlay of Sabin's Pasture. Right. I know they spent a lot of time downtown. Right. You know, a lot of the zoning overlay, you know, if you think about zoning, it's really the exterior of the building. Um, and so that's not as big of a concern, I think, in District 3. Um, you know, because the character of the, the neighborhoods may not be quite as the, the historic uh, districts maybe in, that you see in sometimes in District 2. I mean, that said, you know, mid-century post-World War II does fit, is coming into the category of historic preservation. It's 75 years. Uh, when we talk about uh, historic preservation of, of buildings, you were speaking of post-1950s and pre-war being historic now. Well, they're coming into cusp. If, if something was built in 1950, it's about five years from qualifying as a potentially historic uh, building, because it's 75 years is the marker. Uh, you know, and so that that's simply to say that a lot of the post-war construction that we see um, in District 3 is not that far from actually qualifying for some of the historic preservation. But, you know, I, I, it feels less like, I think, and I think a lot of people would, would agree with this, that the idea that historic preservation is a, is a key concern or component may be less so than the questions of habitability and functionality. You know, one of the big changes that I think really improved District 3 was when, in 2018, when they changed the zoning code to change the setbacks. Because when I was on the zoning board, District 3 was continuously coming, bef homeowners were coming continuously before zoning board to get waivers um, or, uh, you know, variances for decks. Because everybody wanted a deck. And, and it, you know, decks have become integral to how we use our homes now. But a lot of these lots that were designed before zoning was implemented were too shallow or too narrow. And so they had all these problems where they'd have to seek these variances and we'd tie ourselves in knots to grant these decks. So by simply changing that zoning to reflect how the character of this neighborhood was, we, we got rid of a lot of problems for people in the district as well as the city to have to you know, wrestle with a non-issue. Is District 3 the last affordable housing in this town? I think that's an argument that can certainly be made. It's certainly the area where there's the most potential for affordable housing uh, in the sense that I think, you know, there's still If any space. housing is affordable in this exactly. town. Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, I think that's the real, um, you know, one of the real challenges we have as a city is finding places where people can build or buy homes that they can move into on, you know, an early salary in their career as opposed to, you know, these big mansions that, you know, are beyond most people's salary, no matter how far they get in their career, um, to have homes where you can, as a 30 or, four, you know, 35-year-old, move into with your family, um, you know, that's the type of housing we really want to encourage for a city. I'll, again, staying on, on District 3, you've got to get your kids to school. Mm -hmm. uh, the new economic model for our transportation our, our new um, transit system where you can call them up on the app or whatever and set an appointment. Has that had any impact on folks who aren't in that core and can't walk downtown from the meadows or walk downtown? Well, I, I, I think the, the My Ride program that you're referring to, you know, is still sort of in its trial phase. And, you know, I've heard some people say great things about it. I mean, the mayor, for example, takes it to work every day, and she, she has great things to say about it. 
Um, I've heard other people who have had success with it, but I've also heard criticism of it from, from other corners. Um, you know, that's been much more about a question of, of access where people don't have the smartphone or smartphone app. But or assume, the to assuming use it. you had access to but it. Assuming that you do, I think it's a really, well, it's a smart way to allocate transportation. So rather than having a, a bus route that runs no matter who comes or doesn't come, you, you have this on demand system uh, and it does make it more flexible. Um, you know, I have, um, I have two children and uh, my daughter used to ride the bus regularly. Uh, she teaches gymnastics up on the hill. And so, you know, the bus for her was an essential part of how she got from Montpelier if I was at work and my wife was at school um, to, to get to her gymnastics practice or now she coaches. Um, and those, you know, those services on demand make it more flexible and easier um, because she can pick her destination um, and she can pick her time as opposed to having to work with some sort of fixed schedule. Got a question downtown. Yes. We talked about this a year. We talked about this. I've been doing this for five, six years. <laughs> Every year we sit and talk about downtown with everyone. Sure. What are the changes you see? Well, I mean, obviously, other than the fact that retail is frozen right now in amber, it it, it is. You know, I, I think a lot of the things that we did as a city council that have, we've tried to help have been um, have been interesting. You know, for example, uh, we loosened up the parklet ordinance, um, and we did it as a trial last year, but we were just discussing at last night's city council that we're going to probably extend it this year because a lot of the retail businesses are saying, particularly the restaurants. As soon as the snow plows are put away, we want to get tables back out on the street to serve people because in a lot of ways, that's how they stayed alive. Um, and it was very successful in part because the parking issue had been um, relaxed. Uh, people weren't, there weren't as many people coming downtown with the state workers. So it sort of took, a, it made a, a blessing out of what could have been a curse. Um, and so being responsive and being able to handle that, I think was a real triumph and was, you know, help these businesses stay alive and also change the character of the downtown. Having all these cafe-like settings out on the street w was, I think, you know, generally seen as by a lot of people as positive. You know, I think the future of Montpelier downtown, we have two, well, we have one challenge and I think we have one really important uh, quality uh, that's going to push us through. The challenge is with this pandemic, I don't think once it's over, we're gonna see a return to what was in 2019 or the beginning of 2020. You know, state workers aren't necessarily going to come back in the same numbers as much as we want them to. Um, and that's gonna change the character of Montpelier because we have had a long time reliance on uh, people coming to the city every day. Uh, not just visitors, but regular workers who come to the restaurants and the stores and, and you know, purchase things and pay our parking fees. Um, and that's part of what we've had as challenge as a budget. And I think we have a challenge now. How do we re revitalize that? Or how do we start to explore new options? And I think one of the real benefits to Montpelier downtown are businesses like, like yours or the businesses on Langdon Street, um, or a lot of the ones that have opened up this year, um, that really focus on a unique uh, retail experience. You know, you go to the store not because they sell you in bulk the lowest price possible. They're not Amazon on a main street. But what they offer is an incredible experience um, and a really unique one and a personal level of relationship that I think a lot of people post-pandemic are going to be craving because they're not going to want to sit and click on Amazon. They're going to want to interact with people. Anyone who has any extroverted tendencies has been sitting on their hands for a year now waiting to get back out. And I think, you know, if we can encourage retail that's unique, we're going to get a lot of people to come to Montpelier, and that's going to help support the downtown businesses. When people can come visit Vermont again. When they, when they can, and it will. But, I mean, that's really a bright hope. We should be encouraging, you know, businesses like the Corky Pet or Bookspieler Records that, you know, one of, that's, there's a great example of a business, you know, that could have really suffered. But what they did was they started going online. They started creating curated record lists, you know. So you go in there and you don't just get a shelf of records. 
you get an interaction with people that are knowledgeable, that are friendly, that have a relationship that you build with them. Uh, and in some cases, they, they've even created uh, curated packets. So they say, if you want music, let us know. We'll send you sort of a package of what we think you might like. Um, and that's, that's something you won't get uh, on an online re retailer. That's a value added service. Or you know, take the GitUp or Jay Langdon or you know, Rome or any of these businesses, Minikin or Bailey Road. These are really person to person businesses that create this experience, create these relationships that um, are really powerful. And if we can promote that and get people to come either online or in person, um, you know, we have a real shot at keeping our retail strong downtown. So I imagine that you support Dan Groberg and his efforts at Montpelier Live. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's, he's an important part uh, of, of the solution because I think he, he gives a voice to this and gives some some unity to these businesses, um, you know, as we try and reach out beyond our the the four corners of the business. What about the Economic Development Corporation? That uh, seemed to have fallen to the wayside. Well, you know, that's had a series of unfortunate events happen to it. You know, they've struggled with an, uh, getting executive directors. They've tried to reinvent themselves. You know, we zeroed them out for the budget this year, but in part, you know, I think they have a role to play. You know, they've done a lot of behind the scenes foundational work in getting businesses to come, such as uh, the Caledonia Spirits that we talk about. Um, you know, they've done a lot of important um, hand, uh, you know, uh, helping uh, to have these become a reality, and there's probably a role for them to play. I think they're going to have to spend this year figuring out what that role is going to look like, um, because we do need more businesses to come to Montpelier, and we do need more economic opportunities as the state may contract, um, or that can help us, you know, lure in public-private partnerships. Um, you know, they have, they were created in part to give us that private public flexibility um, so that they could act as a private entity in, in furtherance of the public good. The school board said no to the uh, school resource officer. Yes. Half of it belongs to the city, half of it belongs to the schools. You now have that half back, you know, again, you've got right. the, the full officer back. Is there any discussion as to how the police will use that halftime position? No. One of the things we did with this year's budget was to, basically, we gave the instruction to, to the city staff was to, you know, we want level funded. Um, we want to keep, we don't want to put a tax burden on the taxpayers. This is not the year for people to have to, because they're going to be struggling with other things in the second year of the pandemic. Let's, let's level fund it. So one of the things that happened was the police position was kept open. So the SRO position has really, it, it, it isn't as if we now have a position back that we've kept one position that's going to be purposely unfilled. The uh, officer who was providing student resource officer um, staffing is now um, gone ba basically back to the full-time police department, but is fulfilling a full-time role there. Um, and, you know, I think we're going to be looking down the road. There's, there's two things. You know, I think the school board, they, they chose not to fund the student resource officer, um, but they have the challenge in front of them of now really sort of identifying, well, what services did the SRO provide to the school district? And how, Beyond being the point person for school shooters. Exactly, because I think that wasn't just their, I mean, in, that, in some ways that was probably the, the, the most discreet part of their job. The bigger parts of their job were much more being involved in the student community, being a liaison, being a sort of uh, uh, person that could head off um, incidents before they, they arose because they were in the community and aware of these things. So, for example, if you know, there was a party planned or something for underage drinking, they might be able to intervene beforehand. Um, you know, and I think part of what the school district has to do is to look at and identify those type of roles, either formal or informal, that they're playing and, and, and come to a decision as to how they want to staff that. And that may involve some type of modified SRO or it might involve, um, you know, a social worker uh, or something else, but you know, we're certainly as a city there to partner with them and, and support and work with them. There are those in the community who speak of defunding the police mm -hmm. and speak of, of a different model uh, for, for Brian. 
uh, Brian Peter, our sure. police chief. Sir, how does that <laughs> play on council? Well, you know, I think the first of all, you know, we've had a lot of people come and speak, and anytime you have anyone come and speak at council, uh, I give them a lot of credit because it's public speaking, and for some it comes naturally, for some it's a challenge, and you can see, you know, this is a passionate issue for these individuals who come and speak. Um, you know, I think by and large, there's no one on council that is unsympathetic to the idea of the, or the question, can we do things better? Absolutely. But I think, at least for, I'll speak for myself, you know, my concern has always been uh, not rushing into something simply because it has the, the momentum of the zeitgeist. And that really what we need to be, especially with when we talk about public safety, is thoughtful. Um, and so, you know, we created this police review committee in part to answer some of these questions because all of the topics that when you talk about defund the police, n none of them are new. None of them are unique to Montpelier or to Vermont. Um, all of them are shared across communities and all of them arose, you know, over decades. And just take, for example, um, the example I like to give is, is, is mental health. You know, at some point in time in the 70s, a lot of state-run or regional-run mental health facilities started to shut down for good reason. These involved horror stories of mistreatment and, and abuse. And so it was a really good thing that these, these institutions shut down. But they didn't shut down and then have an alternate. They shut down and, and people were just simply put on their own, people who needed help or assistance. And so in those situations, you know, what evolved over time was that police started to be the first respond as first responders, the people who dealt with these populations once they hit crisis. And so, you know, what we're really talking about when we talk about defund the police in this respect, and I don't think you'd have anyone disagree, is starting to rebuild and refund uh, some of the mental health. But wasn't that something that an initiative that Tony had, Tony Fakos, our former police chief, hadn't he tackled that? Years ago? Well, what he, he, he what he did was he brought in a greater sensitivity to that issue. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, and, and, and in some ways, this is, these are the different threads that you start to unravel when you take on these questions. You know, if, you, know, if you look at Montpelier, if you look at our statistics alone, we, we have a really good, um, you know, the data really does show that we do it differently in Montpelier. Differently um, in what sense? Well, if you look at our, um, from a racial uh, bias point of view, you know, our statistics show that we don't pull over or ticket um, more people of, of color or minorities um, than the, than but is a Bill proportion say of the population. You, we do ticket more men than women. <laughs> that may be true. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you look at those statistics, I mean, it does show now that Montpelier, and that, that, there may be many reasons for that. Um, and Tony, uh, when he was chief, and I think Brian has continued it, you know, have brought in a sensitivity and a training to um, mental health case responses. And we do a, a much better job uh, of dealing with it. But, you know, if the core issue of, of defund the police is the police shouldn't be the ones on the mental health front line, I, I think the police would agree with that. Well, they um, have a card that they carry with them. Uh, laminated card that has the mm -hmm. numbers for social services and right. the like. No, and, and they have training about how to recognize and how to identify. And, you know, we have funded a social worker for the police department that's embedded, you know, that's intended to be that, that type of alternative uh, liaison to, uh, you know, bringing, bringing individuals in need to social services. Um, you know, but the problem is, is you know, and if, if, if we give credit to the defund the police, arguments, it's that, you know, at the end of the day, the police are a particular tool. They are first responders. They are public safety officers. They have certain duties to the public that they, that they owe under Vermont law. And, you know, they can't be social workers, and they shouldn't be. Um, and so if we think about, you know, how do we envision the responses that the police department fields, um, and is there a better way to, to segregate out some of these away from, you know, the police to other avenues, you know, I think that's worth studying, but it's not something that's going to be easily answered. And there's no easy solution 
to it and it's thoughtful. I mean, you know, what we've seen in cities like Burlington or, or Minneapolis where there's been sort of a, um, a quick reaction to these, these calls for, you know, defund the police is a lot of them had had to be walked back or they create an adversarial situation um, where, you know, you stop listening to, you know, uh, the, the various stakeholders, which include the police to a certain extent. And, you know, in Montpelier, we've been lucky in that, you know, both with both Tony's leadership and Brian's, you know, they're there saying, yes, we'd love to have more social workers. So we'd love to have, you know, better training or more diversion. And that's exactly what we want. We want those stakeholders to want to, want to be part of it. And so bringing them along and bringing the people that are concerned about, you know, these issues of, of behind defund the police, you know, is a, is a difficult conversation, but it's, it's a good one to have. When we talk about level funding in the place, mm -hmm. this is another issue that comes year after, every year that I, I've done this, I've talked about our crummy streets. And John Holler was mayor when I first started these. And John would sit and say in the early years, I'm gonna put a fund aside so that we can level fund these streets mm -hmm. and so that we can keep our streets up so that they don't fall to disrepair and become more expensive. And John kept this word and we set up a fund and then the pandemic came. Yep. What happened to the fund? Well, the fund's still there. Um, you know, we're just, uh, and, and we're, we're by and large on, on track. This year's budget is the exception in that, um, and you know, I was very clear in asking Bill about this, you know, and he was very clear in answering, this is not a sustainable budget. We can't keep the budget that we put for fiscal year 2022 that the voters are gonna be voting on. Why is this not meeting. a sustainable budget? Because it involves putting off certain pieces of uh, capital improvement, uh, whether it be personnel, equipment, um, some of the maintenance, and some of the street projects that we've tried to, you know, we've, we, we've delayed where there's hopefully the most minimal impact uh, but it's intended to be a level funded budget in part because we wanted to make sure that the taxpayers didn't have this burden on them and recognizing too that, you know, this was a year where revenue was going to be down. So it wasn't the year to take on new big projects. It was a year to, to see if we can get on the other side. Now, the way the project, the way the budget is built, if we get state money or federal money, we can Backfill. Backfill, bring back some projects in. And so, you know, what we tried to do was keep the services that we have provided as a city and that residents have come to rely upon at, at as close to an even level as possible. Um, and some of that has meant, you know, so we might pave one less street this year than we had previously planned. It's not that we've depleted the, these budgets for road maintenance. It's just that with the other costs associated with it, you know, we need to keep that level down so that we can then keep the same level of DPW workers um, and, you know, maybe, but maybe not hire the additional one that we need. Last year, we spent a lot of time on these shows talking about the downtown plan. Sure. That was then under discussion, having all kinds of hearings around. Is, has that been relegated to a fantasy status or has that been pushed off? No, I, you know, we approved the downtown plan um, early on in the year, but you know, you know, to ex to a large extent, this year's council has been a reactive council in the sense that we've had new challenges come up on an almost weekly basis. You know, uh, for example, like I said, with the parklet thing, where we had businesses that were, you know, really pleading to to have that opportunity, um, and so we were trying to react in real time or retail businesses that were struggling and working with the Economic Development Corporation and others to see if there was any form of rent relief that we could, um, you know, midwife into, into reality, which we did. Um, you know, these type of, uh, you know, mask mandates suddenly became an issue. We, we never thought we'd have to, you know, um, create a rule about people wearing masks, but the pandemic has made that uh, a reality. And how, how do we deal with that? And so, you know, to a certain extent, the planning has, has taken a back seat, but I don't think it's disappeared. But I also think this is an opportunity, you know, where we need to check back in once we start to get on the other side of this pandemic. Because as I indicated before, you, you know, we're headed into new territory. The, the world is gonna look very different in 2022 and 2023 than it did in 2019. So we might revisit that plan that had us widening the sidewalks. 
massive right. plan, big plans like that might be revisited. Would that include the recreation center? Um, I would I would assume that I would put that on the table. Um, you know, because I think we have a big question with the recreation center and what function does it use that we didn't have a year ago because you know one thing that we have to think about with the recreation center is ventilation and spacing you know before we could gather all we wanted we could have a springsteen concert in there <laughs> um and it wouldn't we wouldn't have had the same type of public health concerns that we do today uh, i mean just imagining even a small folk concert in there probably is cause for concern um in this covid world one more question i'll let you go are you zoomed out <laughs> Some days, it's definitely, that's one thing that I have really uh, has been difficult. And I was talking with someone about this the other day. Um, I miss the city council meetings where we could be there live because to interact with people, to have someone stand up at the microphone and, and you know, bring their concern forward or tell their story w was really powerful that you just don't get that translated to on um, a flat screen. And you know, I think every now and then about the ridiculousness of my situation sitting in a room, um, you know, talking into a box um, as if that was real connection. Um, but at the same time, you know, Zoom has been great in allowing greater distribution of access. You know, if you're homebound, you no longer have the issue of can I attend the a city council meeting in a meaningful way. As long as you can get onto a computer, you can be a participant. Um, and so in that way, it's been really democratizing. And I think that's been a, a really good thing. On democratizing, that brings us to the end of this one, but do, do pay attention to town meeting and, and make sure you get out and vote and make sure you vote intelligently. Watch all of these shows. They're really good. We have a great slate of candidates, as we always do. And Bill's, sex, Bill's particular presentation on the city budget is good. Uh, Jim on the school budget is well taken. Anne's one is extremely good on, on the city and her view from the mayor's seat. And again, we've got the schools, we've got the city council people, we even have a person running for a five-year term on the Park Commission. You can see the shows on Orca Media's YouTube channel. You can watch them on cable television. But do get out and vote. I, it, it's even easier. Cast an absentee ballot. You don't even have to go there on town meeting day, but do make sure that your vote and your voice are heard. Thank you very much.